Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's presentation. On behalf of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Biology, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's uh, With Insight program, Pushing Boundaries and Breaking Barriers Against Brain Cancer. Tonight's featured research bridges two of the Koch Institute's five research focus areas, marrying nanotechnology and precision cancer medicine. By nanotechnology, I'm referring to the unique properties that certain materials have at the molecular scale. And by precision cancer medicine, I mean applying the right drug to the right patient at the right time. My name is Dr. Michael B. Yaffe, and I will be the moderator for tonight's session. Tonight's session also showcases the impact of our clinical relationships at the Koch Institute including the KI's Clinical Investigator Program, which I'm fortunate enough to direct, and our signature research programs, including the Koch Institute Frontier Research Program, a philanthropically supported seed funding program for early stage, high risk, high reward research. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about brain cancer. Cancer researchers have long sought to develop new strategies for treating an aggressive brain tumor called glioblastoma multiform one of the most difficult to treat cancers. There are currently only four approved treatments, three of which are drugs and one of which is a device, and the median life expectancy for glioblastoma patients is less than 15 months. In 2020, 13,000 Americans will be diagnosed with this tumor, which accounts for roughly 50% of all primary malignant brain tumors. It's estimated that 10,000 individuals in the United States will die of that disease in the next 12 months. And I'm sad to tell you that the survival rates for glioblastoma patients are only about 6.8%. And the average length of survival, as I mentioned, varies from 12 to 18 months. These statistics, this dismal survival has been unchanged for decades. Despite being first identified in the scientific literature in the 1920s, there have only been three drugs and one device that have ever passed at, been approved by the FDA for the treatment of glioblastoma. And none of these treatments have succeeded in significantly extending the lives of patients beyond a few extra months. The mean age of diagnosis is 64. And in addition to being life-threatening, the treatments that are involved in attempting to control the behavior of this tumor inflict devastation upon the brain, which controls cognition, mood, behavior, and every function of every organ and body part. Glioblastoma is also one of the most expensive cancers to treat, often leaving patients and families with major financial hardship on top of the burdens of the disease. And this tumor type is no stranger to many prominent Americans. Americans who have lost their lives to this type of cancer include Bo Biden, the son of our president-elect, U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy, U.S. Senator John McCain, and Edward Tug McGraw, a Major League Baseball player and the father of country music star and actor Tim McGraw. These kind of intractable challenges, like glioblastoma, are where the Koch Institute's interdisciplinary collaborative research model can really offer something different and really has an opportunity to shine. In a few moments, you'll hear from Dr. Fred Lamb, a clinical scholar and a neurosurgeon at McMaster University, a former Koch Institute researcher and a current affiliate in my lab at the Koch Institute about a novel combination therapy for GBM that, has helped, that he helped identify. And then you'll hear from Paula Hammond, a KI faculty member and the head of the chemical engineering department about how her participation in the work has really been key to advancing this new therapy for potential clinical translation. And finally, Fred will be joined by Dr. Joella Strela, an instructor in pediatric hematology oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Boston Children's Hospital, and a postdoctoral researcher in Paula's lab to discuss the future of this work. Now, before I let them speak, let me remind you to use the question and answer interface at the bottom of your screen to submit questions as you listen to the presentations. At the end of the presentations, we'll bring everyone together and answer as many of these questions as we can. Please don't be shy. If you have a question, please send it in. 
You don't need to wait to the end of the presentations to submit your questions. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Fred Lamb from McMaster University and the Koch Institute. Fred, the show is yours. Thanks, Mike. Um, really honored to be part of this event, uh, extremely collaborative event uh, between engineers and biologists, very unique uh, platform at the Koch Institute. And I'm very excited to be able to share some of the work that I had uh, the good fortune to uh, be involved in during my time as a postdoctoral uh, fellow at uh, the Koch Institute, uh, both in uh, kind of straddling between three labs, really, um, first with uh, Dr. Yaffe's lab, and then in collaboration with Dr. Hammond's lab, and then my first PI, Dr. Scott Floyd's lab, uh, who was a clinical investigator at the Koch Institute and previous uh, postdoc in the Yaffe lab. So as uh, Dr. Yaffe had alluded to, you know, glioblastoma is the most common and most aggressive primary tumor of the brain. And, you know, the current standard of care for gliomas has not changed over the last several decades. And it includes, from a surgical standpoint, if we can, aggressive surgical resection. So here we have an MRI image on the left showing a enhancing glioblastoma, a very infiltrative, and aggressive brain tumor. And following safe surgical resection as much as we can in the operating room to remove what we can see um, in the MRI, the patients are then treated with concurrent chemotherapy. And the most common FDA approved drug, uh, temozolomide, um, is a common DNA damaging agent that has been used for decades. It is a non specific. DNA damaging agent that destroys cancer cell DNA, but unfortunately also wreaks havoc on healthy cancer cells, not only in the brain, but in other parts of the body. Combine that with radiation therapy, which is a very focused delivery of ionizing radiation to the surgical cavity or the remaining disease that we haven't been able to excise in the OR, it only leads to survival statistics that are very dismal. So mean survival is about 11 to 15 months for these GBM patients. And this statistic has not improved uh, for the last 20 years. And that really addresses a large unmet need to define more specific therapies that are targeted and also novel uh, technologies that can both deliver these therapies uh, into the brain and be specifically delivered to the brain tumor. And these are really some of the main challenges affecting delivery of therapies to the brain. Now the brain is a very sacred organ. It's, it's protected by the blood brain barrier. And this blood brain barrier is a very tight um, uh, highway and network of vasculature that's very unique to this part of the body. And it protects the brain from entry of about 90% of what is currently treated, used to treat uh, other patients, uh, other types of cancer patients. So chemotherapies that would normally get to cells elsewhere in the body because of this blood brain barrier prevents it from entering the brain and causing unwanted neurotoxic effects. Now, unfortunately, that really cripples the ability for neuro-oncologists to deliver new therapies across this blood brain barrier. Secondly, once these drugs or small molecules get into the brain, the, the high cellular complexity of the central nervous system makes it very challenging to then direct these therapies to the tumor itself and spare the, uh, the, uh, the bystander effects of, of toxicity to neurons and healthy brain cells. And so this has really been a large um, uh, limitation and bottleneck to new therapies and new treatments for this very aggressive disease. Now the Yaffe lab and other labs have been uh, studying this new class of inhibitors, small molecule inhibitors called bromodomain inhibitors uh, for the treatment of different types of cancers. And bromodomain inhibitors inhibit uh, this class of proteins called the BET bromodomain proteins. The prototypical example here is BRD4. And what bromodomain proteins do is they are transcriptional co-activators. They bind to RNA polymerase and they incite transcription. And a lot of this transcription 
it is of genes that affect cancer cell survival. So when the small molecule inhibitor JQ1, which was developed in Jay Bradner's lab over at the Dana-Farber, uh, it was developed to inhibit uh, and block BRD4's function amongst other types of bromo domain proteins. And what happens is BRD4 then gets knocked off the chromatin and DNA, and it decreases these transcriptional programs that affect cancer cell survival. And you see decreased tumor burden and increased survival in different animal models of cancer. Bromodomain inhibitors are now in early phase clinical trials, both in patients with liquid tumors and also more recently uh, for solid tumors and including brain cancer. So there is large translational potential in studying the mechanisms of actions of these bromodomain inhibitors. So one, the first project that I was assigned to when I became a postdoc um, at the Ku Institute was working with um, Dr. Yaffe and also uh, Dr. Floyd, who was a former Koch uh, in, in Institute clinical investigator and postdoc in the Yaffe lab to, to investigate the, the participation of BRD4 in regulating the DNA damage response to ionizing radiation in cancer cells. And what Scott found through a high content uh, siRNA screen was that a specific isoform of BRD4, when overexpressed, would insulate and protect the chromatin from inciting this DNA damage response. So every time DNA gets damaged, either by chemotherapy or by radiation, cells are able to incite this DNA damage uh, response signaling. It allows for the repair of the DNA and genome stability of the cell. Now with this specific isoform of BRD4, what Scott was able to find was that it, when overexpressed, would insulate the chromatin, would prevent this DNA damage response signaling from happening and cause uh, cancer cell death. So this was really what started the Yaffe lab um, and this collaborative effort that we're gonna see uh, later on in this talk, studying the effects of bromodomain inhibitors for treatments of cancer. And one of the later findings that, that came out of Scott's study was that when we treated cancer cells, certain cancer cells with just the bromodomain inhibitor JQ1 alone, in the absence of ionizing radiation, we saw DNA damage. And I will discuss some of the mechanisms of why we and other labs, including Scott's lab, have figured out why we believe that bromodomain inhibitors cause DNA damage in a certain type of cancer cells and how we can leverage that for the treatment of GBM. So if we go back to our, our, stat, our slide of the current standard of care of gliomas, you know, Scott and I first asked ourselves, you know, could we leverage this effect, this DNA damage effect of Roman domain inhibitors alone with the DNA damaging agent team zolomide, currently FDA approved for the treatment of GBM for improved treatment of gliomas. And what we did was we added both JQ1 and temozolomide in a Petri dish with different types of glioma cell lines. And this is an immunofluorescence picture of two different types of glioma cell lines. And what we see in the blue is a DNA stain. Anything that's blue stains the nucleus where the DNA is. And anything that's red is signs of DNA damage. So when we treat cells with vehicle control in the absence of drug, we don't see a lot of DNA damage. As expected, when we treat cells with temozolomide, we see increased DNA damage staining. When we treat the cells with JQ1 alone, we also see increased DNA damage staining. But when we combine both JQ1 and temozolomide, we see additive effects. So there's a lot more DNA damage everywhere in the nuclei of both of these glioma cell lines. So that was an interesting phenomenon that Scott and I both wanted to further pursue. And so the question then was, well, you know, if we translate that out of a Petri dish, will this actually work in a live animal or, or even in patients? And the main question and concern again was this blood brain barrier. So even though patients are treated with uh, temozolomide through uh, systemic therapy, only about 20% of serum circulating levels of temozolomide reach, reach the brain. It does cross the blood brain barrier, 
but very few percentages of the drug actually do cross the blood-brain barrier. Same with JQ1, this bromodomain inhibitor that we're using. And secondly, once these drugs reach the brain, you know, the brain is bathed in the cerebrospinal fluid that constantly washes drugs away. So we're really dealing with very much like, um, you know, this upstream salmon swimming upstream and hopefully delivering its target uh, therapies to the cells that we want it to and avoid uh, bystander damage to these healthy cells. So Scott and I asked, well, what can we use to specifically cross the blood-brain barrier and deliver these therapies to the brain? And that really kind of leads to where Dr. Hammond's work and her expertise and her lab's expertise in nanoparticles uh, comes through. So at this point in time, I'm going to um, surrender my screen share to Dr. Hammond. Thank you, Fred. Uh, and I'm excited to have a chance to talk about this amazing collaboration. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, describe some of the work that we do in our lab, which involves nanomedicine. Uh, essentially, the challenge here is being able to package drugs so that you can lower the toxicity of the drug and uh, allow it to travel through the bloodstream without interacting or engaging with uh, uh, large numbers of healthy cells. Now, um, one of the big challenges in nanomedicine is to find a way to deliver uh, drugs to the body through, for example, a systemic delivery, such as an injection through the bloodstream. And typically anything that goes in is going to circulate throughout the body. How do we get this carrier to accumulate where we want it, which is the tumor, and to retain its cargo until it gets to the tumor and ultimately is able to deliver the drug to the tumor cells that are present there. Along with this challenge, we'd like to be able to control the release of the drug. We'd like to be able to scale this drug uh, delivery process so that we can make enough of it and have ease of manufacture and also reproducibility. So there are several things that we look at from the nanomedicine perspective that is relevant to all solid tumors. And I'll talk about that and then we'll get to this particular challenge of the blood-brain barrier. In our lab, we actually use nanomaterials to get uh, a drug packaged and then delivered directly to the tumor. The way that we do this is by taking a known nano carrier. For example, liposomes are known to generate uh, particles which can contain drug as well as polymeric nanoparticles. We can take that core, let's say it's a liposome, and if it has a net negative charge, we can actually decorate it by adsorbing a positively charged polymer on top of it. And following the positively charged polymer, we can then adsorb a negatively charged material and then a positively charged polymer. And we have been using this as an approach to introduce nucleic acids to the outer sphere of the nanoparticle. And in doing so, this allows us to incorporate a separate drug. Finally, we introduce an outer layer and this outer layer is negatively charged. It's extremely well hydrated and uh, it surrounds this nanoparticle in what we call a stealth layer. We call it stealth because the nanoparticle when injected interacts much less with the kinds of immune cells that would eliminate the nanoparticle before it has a chance to traverse uh, the entire blood system. It does this because it has a huge amount of associated water that travel with it and negative charge. And this water and negative charge make the nanoparticle look like something that is native to the body and therefore isn't as readily eliminated. And it also provides electrostatic repulsion from mammalian cells that tend to also bear a net negative charge because of the glycans that are bound to their cell membranes. So we have this outer green stealth layer that we use for a number of the targeting projects that we do in uh, cancer in our lab. To that outer layer, we can attach a range of different molecular ligands, molecules which bind to the outer surface of our targeted cancer cells. And these can be antibodies, but they can also be small molecules and proteins that bind to specific receptors 
that are unique to the cancer cell that we're targeting. And this ends up being an important technology uh, when we begin to talk about our challenge of the blood-brain barrier. Now, uh, when we do this, we are able to generate uh, these nanoparticles that are surrounded by our layer by layer system. We call this LBL for short, and we can actually tune them for specific uptake by cells. This is a modular design. Uh, one of the important things about this design and the design of other nanoparticles is that it's thought that because tumors grow very rapidly, they have blood vessels that because of that rapid development have defects in them. Uh, it's thought that this leaky vasculature allows nanoscale materials that are flowing through the bloodstream to get taken up into the tissue when it gets to the tumor. So you can think about this uh, uh, sort of preferred accumulation. Here we're showing accumulation of nanoparticles in tumors that are on the flanks of these mice after 24 hours. Uh, we can think of it very much as uh, the kind of thing you might expect when you introduce a pinball into a machine and you allow this pinball to sort of get through and then ratchet around in the tumor tissue before it finds an opportunity to roll back out of the defect again. That long residence time that the nanoparticle has within the tumor tissue, because it's gotten in through that leak, allows an opportunity for tumor cells to take up the nanoparticle cargo. And that gives us an opportunity to deliver our drug. Now, this effect can work on a number of solid tumors, but not on all tumors. It relies on the idea that we have these leaky blood vessels. And this is something that is not going to be the case, for example, for our blood brain barrier. Now, one of the things that we did early on in our work was look at how we could actually target specifically the tumor cells. And we found that for some of our outer layers, such as the one shown here, which is hyaluronic acid, we can actually get specific uptake because we have tumor cells that overexpress a receptor, a protein that binds to hyaluronic acid. And that gives us preferred accumulation of the nanoparticle in the cell. And we can see that the nanoparticle can actually travel through the stromal layers of the tumor and get into these tumorigenic cells, which are shown here in red. Uh, and the nanoparticles, which are shown in green, have a good overlay with them. So we have a multiple means of targeting. It was actually in a collaboration with Mike Yaffe uh, that we began looking at liposome carriers as well. Now in this work, uh, Stephen Morton, a graduate student, former graduate student in my lab, had been designing layer by layer nanoparticles. And in a conversation with Mike Yaffe, uh, we learned of the uh, incredible systems biology work uh, that had been going on in his lab, which suggested that a time delivery of an inhibitor followed by a chemotherapy drug could lead to a much more efficacious synergy between these two drugs. So Stephen began looking at liposomes themselves because they contain an interior compartment that is water-filled and they have a lipid membrane which can incorporate a range of hydrophobic drugs. And he found that he could actually incorporate uh, a water-soluble drug like this chemotherapy drug doxorubicin in the core, and he can incorporate an amphiphilic or hydrophobic drug into the lipid bilayer that the lipids form around that aqueous core. Uh, so it, Stephen actually encapsulated these two drugs and found that they released in a staggered fashion with the inhibitor coming out first and the doxorubicin coming out more slowly thus allowing the reprogramming of the cells. And uh, this ended up being a very effective treatment. And here we're looking at, again, triple negative breast cancer uh, cells on the flanks of mice, and we can see a very significant difference. Now, what came from that were a range of uh, interesting conversations. And this happened in typical Coke fashion. I call this the Coke elevator encounter. These encounters happen in elevators and in the dining area and uh, at the Coke retreat and a number of other uh, kinds of places, the lounges, uh, Stephen ended up meeting Fred. And Fred, who had been working with Scott, 
uh, had been looking at uh, this uh, combination that you just heard him speak about. And the real question was, can we design a way of getting a nanoparticle that carries these two drugs safely across the blood-brain barrier without releasing and interacting with other cells? And uh, this was then the challenge that Stephen took up. And he used the same liposome design, which can again contain these two drugs, one water soluble and one more amphiphilic as a way to address this blood brain barrier problem. Now, the key here is that we can't rely on leaks anymore. So we need a way to get across that blood brain barrier. And one way to do that is that cells are able to undergo a process known as transcytosis in which essentially the particle can bind to a receptor that enables transcytosis. If that is the case, then it can be carried in the compartment across the cell and released out on the other end so that we go from the inside of the blood vessel to the tumor tissue uh, going through the cell instead of going around the gaps between the cell. So to do this, we need to interact specifically with receptors on the uh, blood vessel cells that allow us to get across. And we ended up using uh, a couple of different molecular ligands, including transferrin and folate to look at this uh, kind of transcytosis. So we took this liposome, which was functionalized with polyethylene glycol, very hydrated chains that give a, a kind of stealth quality. And we attached at the end of the ethylene glycol ligands, which included a ligand for transferrin that is going to uh, essentially bind the transferrin receptor on the blood vessel cells. And we also looked at folate, which also had shown some promise. And finally, we did look at hyaluronic acid. One of our favorite uh, materials is another approach. Here you can see a window that is looking on the brain of a, of a mouse. And this is uh, uh, in uh, Fred and Scott's lab. We can see that there is very nice uh, blood flow through these vessels because these vessels are highly intact. Now, the question is, when we introduce nanoparticles, we see those nanoparticles stay and remain in the blood vessels. However, when we have our functionalized nanoparticles, they actually go through the vessels. Here you can see some of those vessels and get into the surrounding tissue, which is the first early sign that we are able to cross that blood brain barrier. Now, um, we found that uh, these functionalized liposomes can cross an intact blood brain barrier. We did uh, examine uh, nude mice and valve C mice. Uh, in this case, uh, we're looking at the in it's essentially the uh, transcytosis into the brain, which is present in these animals. In particular, we found that uh, folate and transferrin uh, did a much better job than polyethylene glycol. And we can see here uh, where we have labeled the nanoparticles with uh, a red fluorescence that we get much more of this fluorescence uh, with transferrin. Finally, when we looked at uh, glioblastoma model, we found that the functionalized liposomes are able to cross the blood brain barrier and get taken up into the tumors in the glioblastoma model. And here you can see uh, that the tumors are shown in green, uh, the nanoparticles in red, and the polyethylene glycol, which is a classical uh, nanoparticle. Typically, you have just a shell of polyethylene glycol, which is a very hydrated molecule, um, it does not really get in. However, our transferrin nanoparticle is able to get in and we can see that uh, there's uh, actually a um, merging of these two, the tumor and the nanoparticle. So this was our early sign of success. And the question was, uh, where do we go from here? So I'm gonna turn things over to Fred. Thank you, Paula. 
So then what Stephen was able to do was he was able to package our two drugs of interest. He was able to package temozolomide into the center of this liposome and layer uh, the JQ1 into its lipophilic bilayer. And what Paula had shown in the previous slide is that here again, we see this green fluorescent um, glioma tumor in the brain of a mouse. And we see the coating of the nanoparticles on the surface. And you know, we can really appreciate that in a, a time-dependent manner um, as we injected these functionalized, transparent functionalized nanoparticles containing these two drugs into the bloodstream of the mice that they did accumulate across the blood-brain barrier and onto the surface of our glioma, that's, uh, glioma tumors. So we were also very interested in then asking what was the downstream effects of uh, these uh, functionalized nanoparticles and be able to deliver this cargo of the dual therapies to these mice. Can they recapitulate and reproduce the effects of the cell killing and the DNA damage that we had seen in our Petri dish experiments early on with the two different types of glioma cell lines? So here we have some immunohistochemistry um, uh, staining of the brain slices of these glioma tumors. And as we can see, uh, when we give the mice free drugs, so this is JQ1 or temozolomide or a combination of both into the bloodstream and track their ability to cause DNA damage or cell death to the brain tumors in these brains of these mice, we can see that there is some staining of DNA damage caused by both either JQ1 or temozolomide, as well as cell death within the tumor tissue itself. And when we combine both JQ1 and temozolomide, we can see quantitatively increases in DNA damage and cell death. Now, if we compare them to the mice that were treated with the transparent functionalized nanoparticles that carry these cargo, what we can appreciate is that there is even more DNA damage and cell death uh, with functionalized nanoparticles that carry JQ1 or temozolomide or both JQ1 and temozolomide alone. So this was very promising as a proof of principle that we can use a nanoscale material that can be functionalized to carry cargo across the blood-brain barrier and deliver it specifically to brain tumor tissue and spare DNA damage of surrounding healthy uh, uh, brain tissue. So at this point in time, I'd like to, to uh, turn the, um, uh, the uh, uh, presentation over and, and introduce Dr. Joelle Strala um, to really talk about uh, the taking this platform to the next level um, uh, in the hand lab. So welcome, Joelle. Thank you so much, Fred and Paula and Mike. Um, I'm very happy to be able to join you guys tonight. Um, my story starts a little bit um, kind of right at the same time that Fred was publishing this paper. So in 2017, I was a pediatric oncology fellow meaning I was a pediatrician in training to become an oncologist at Dana-Farber and Boston Children's. And I had the opportunity through my time in training to join a lab um, and perform research. And I really had this opportunity to study anything I wanted. And I have to tell you how um, really unique the Koch Institute experience was when I came and met with Paula to talk about how my real goal in my career was to improve the outcomes for patients with brain tumors by using new drug delivery technologies. And she told me, we have a wonderful project going on. Um, and we're collaborating with the Yaffe Lab, the Floyd Lab. Um, she introduced me to Fred and to Mike right away. Um, and it was a very unique opportunity for me to join um, really a collaborative group of people that were extremely welcoming. Um, and so I wanna tell you just a few minutes here about where this project is going now and how are we gonna build off of this great work um, that was done primarily by Stephen and Fred under the um, directing of Paula um, and Scott and Mike. So as um, Fred mentioned, and I think it's probably clear to everyone, getting drugs into the brain is not an easy task, um, but there are other things we need to think about as well. So what are the healthy organs in the body going to do when that drug, when they see that drug? How do we get past the blood brain barrier? Um, but very importantly, how do drugs, and in our case, nanoparticles with drugs in them, actually interact with brain tumor cells? 
also um, in collaboration with everyone, we decided as um, primarily in the Hammond lab, we wanted to focus on two major drug delivery goals so that we could meet back up with the Yaffe lab who was working on this amazing biology of finding new combination therapies. And these two goals were um, the first to improve the nanoparticle delivery into cancer cells. So getting them the nanoparticles near the cancer is very important, but as Fred mentioned, there are many cell types um, that make up the brain. And for me in particular, being a pediatrician studying um, brain tumors, we know that the developing brain is extremely sensitive. And so we need to be careful when we're delivering some of these drugs, especially those that are what we call epigenetic modifiers that can make changes to how DNA is expressed in our cells. We really want the drug to go to the cancer cell much more than the normal cell. And then of course, we saw some great early results from this paper looking at transferrin as a way to get across the blood brain barrier, but there are actually many different ligands that are out there. Um, and by ligand, I mean something that can bind to a receptor and lead to transcytosis. And so we wanted to compare some of those to see how do we get the best delivery. So really trying to optimize and take forward things so that we can get closer and closer to the clinic. So as Paula mentioned, we love to use the layer by layer process um, in her lab. And this is a wonderful thing for um, studying things in the lab, but also can be clinically translated because as you can see, we might start with one liposome here, but then we have the ability through this iterative process to make many different nanoparticles that might have different surface coatings and also different receptor ligands. And you can start to see how you might build a library and try to find which is the absolute best way to get this drug into a tumor of interest. And here I'm just showing a few pictures where green is the nanoparticle signal. And then you can see kind of the whole tumor cell on the right side. And when we use just a liposome by itself, there's very few nanoparticles that stay in interaction and are actually inside a cancer cell. And this is after 24 hours. And then by functionalizing at this first level here with just an outer layer, we get much improvement. And then using a receptor that we know is expressed by the cancer cell, we can even improve that further. So in terms of our first goal of improving cancer cell interaction with nanoparticles, we feel like we have a really great start. But the second problem of getting across the blood brain barrier um, is really a huge challenge. And one thing that we know would make our lives a lot easier is if we had a model in the lab um, that wasn't an animal model, because there's many steps to getting to a human clinical trial, but it's extremely difficult to test even three or four different formulations, let alone 30 or 40. And so having something like an, a blood brain barrier in a dish would be a really elegant way to study um, how we're doing drug delivery. And so we're working with some other labs here at MIT. And here in this picture, we're just showing some blood vessels that are actually grown in a microfluidic system. Um, so here in the middle, you can see blood vessels that are um, kind of growing in a very similar way to how the blood brain barrier is. They're supported here by other cells that also come from the brain. Um, and then we can see our nanoparticles and watch them in real time as they can cross these man-made blood brain barriers that are on a chip. And taking those to the next stage, what we really wanna do is make sure that these models we're using to study the blood brain barrier are actually predictive of what happens first in a model like a mouse um, and then ultimately in a human patient. And so these are just very similar images, but actually taken of a mouse brain through a cranial window. And I have to say thank you to Fred here for teaching me to do these surgeries before he um, went to pursue his um, neurosurgery career at McMaster recently. As a pediatrician by training, I don't consider myself a neurosurgeon, but have learned enough at the Koch Institute to be able to do um, some very nice work. And so what we see here is the blood vessels on the left side, and you can um, get a sense in this time-lapse image that we can watch flow happening. You can actually see very small shadows passing through the blood vessels, and those are red blood cells. So these are very, very small intact blood vessels. And then we can watch the nanoparticles as they leave the blood vessels and traffic into the intact brain. And so the next step of this project is to take this into tumors. So I hope I've given you just a, a little scope of how we're taking forward this collaboration um, from Paula Hammond's side of the project. Um, but I definitely want to make note that this is an amazing um, collaboration really started um, as it appears from that talk in the elevator. 
And the Koch Institute is a place like that where we have this opportunity to work alongside biologists. Um, I'm a material science engineer by training and a physician, but I don't have a strong of a biology background. And yet Mike Yaffe, Fred Lith, and many others are really doing the, the very difficult work of systems biology to find new drugs. And so when we are each able to work to our strengths, but also understand and speak the same language and have the same goals, um, in this case, improving the outcomes for a really devastating brain tumor, um, it makes for a very special project. So I feel quite fortunate to be a part of this. And actually through this collaboration, we've been able to um, have a new international collaboration trying to take this work even closer to the clinic. And that's allowed our labs to um, really take this work even farther. So in real time, even during COVID, um, we were having Zoom calls, collaborating, sharing our data, and talking about the next drugs that will go into the next optimized nanoparticle that we hope is going to take things even better um, in terms of treating patients with glioma. So with that, I think I'll pass it back to Mike Yaffe for moderation or Fred, up to you guys. How about, how about I just finish off um, and just kind of really exemplify what, um, what um, Joelle was saying is how, how collaborative these these labs, both the Yaffe and the Hammond lab um, are at, at the Institute. And, and I think both Joelle and I are, are real beneficiaries of this collaborative effort um, between labs. And, and you know, very similar to what Joelle was saying, we're now able to study even further um, to the recent work that just comes out from, from Mike's lab, um, what we really think is the mechanism of action of these bromodomain inhibitors. And, at, you know, as Joelle was saying, these are inhibitors that are currently being used in the clinic, but you know, there's a lot of other types of mechanisms of actions that we, we are starting to, to be able to think that we can leverage with other types of combination therapies. And so what, what, what work from the Yaffe Lab is now kind of funneling into um, these platforms of delivery through the Hammond Lab is the ability to then design um, combination therapies using targeted small molecule inhibitors where we believe that the mechanism of action for BRD4 inhibition is causing this DNA damage due to collision of these very basic cellular mechanisms of transcription and replication. And what another uh, very talented postdoc in, in Mike's lab, Yuan Kong, um, has helped us do is identify this mechanism where we think why DNA damage is happening in cancer cells or we're treating these cells with thermodynamic inhibitors. And this then also allows us to then uh, study through a systems biology approach, the different networks of signaling and um, cell pathways that, that can also be targeted uh, to form this higher order combination therapy that we think can then be uh, likely packaged into um, the Hammond Labs, uh, very sophisticated nanoparticle systems to then change this outcome, this very dismal outcome for this current standard of care for therapies of gliomas where we're currently still using very non-specific DNA damage therapies. Now, I'm very biased as a surgeon that I think we will still need to operate on uh, patients with brain tumors to remove the tumor bulk in order for uh, these uh, therapies to work. But then can we then leverage targeted therapies with novel mechanisms of delivery um, and really push the survival statistics past this very dismal, uh, at best five-year um, survival point? And so now with that, um, I think I will pass it back to Mike for a uh, question and answer. Thank you so much. So thank you all. Let me um, begin by thanking Professor Hammond and Fred and Joella for those excellent presentations. I will just reiterate what you've already heard, which is um, this type of collaboration and this type of progress is really only possible um, because of the people that are involved. You know, it's, it's, it's the brilliance of Paula Hammond and the ability of her lab to translate ideas into something that really works, that really has fueled this terrific collaboration um, between uh, her lab and, and my lab. And I also wanna emphasize that one thing that's really special about this project has been that, is that the, the junior people that have been involved in promoting this actually are all clinicians and they're all involved in the care of these types of patients. Scott Floyd is a radiation oncologist who treats patients with GBM. Uh, Dr. Strela, as you've heard, is a 
pediatric oncologist who treats these kind of patients, and Fred and Dr. Fred Lamb, of course, is a neurosurgeon who operates on these types of patients. And it's only at a place like MIT where you can actually have this interaction of chemical engineers and systems biologists and clinicians in a way that is so productive. I really have to take a moment to thank the frontier donors in the audience who made all of this work possible. Um, and I see we already have some questions, so I'm gonna pick a few and throw them out there. Um, so the first question that I'm gonna um, bring up and, and is, um, is a question uh, that, that, that asks, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll offer this one to Joella, what's the lifetime of nanoparticles in the bloodstream? Do they hydrolyze? Do they break down? What's their ultimate fate? It's a great question um, and actually something that our lab really strives to characterize when we design nanoparticles. So as you might imagine, every nanoparticle is different. And so a very simple liposome might be quickly cleared by the body, especially through what we call the reticuloendothelial system, things like the liver and the spleen that are trying to detoxify our body from drugs. Um, but actually um, a lot of this layer by layer technology that Paula was describing to you can help to extend the lifetime in the body um, upwards of 24, 48, or even longer in terms of timing. And so the longer these nanoparticles circulate, the better chance they have to interact with a tumor cell. And if they're actually able to get into a tumor cell, that drug is gonna stay there for the duration. Um, so there's a huge range. Um, and I think that the question brings up a great point that these things need to be studied in a lab um, and in animal models before we go trying them on humans. And so that's one of our, our big, um, the onus is on us to, to really make these safe and effective before translating them to patients. I'm gonna throw the next question out at, at, um, at Paula Hammond. There've been a few questions that have asked, what percentage of temozolomide or JQ1 uh, uptake do you see with the nanoparticles in the brain? And is it as high as when the drugs are taken orally or by other routes? And, um, and is, there, are there, um, is there some estimate about how to improve the biodistribution of the nanoparticles? Do most of them end up in the tumor or do most of them end up somewhere else? Now that's another great question. And it turns out that in the world of nanomedicine for a more typical tumor, solid tumor, uh, we see a good nanoparticle um, accumulation might give us something between four and 6% injected dose, which means that even with our nanoparticle targeting and accumulation, that a large amount of the drug that is delivered systemically exits the body um, without getting reaching its target goal. Um, but when we compare this to what happens to a small molecule when it's injected in the bloodstream, uh, gets cleared within uh, minutes to within an hour, uh, it's actually a much better uh, amount of accumulation of drug. So even that small amount makes a big difference. Now with the blood-brain barrier, one of the biggest issues has been getting even a small amount of drug across that blood-brain barrier. And that depends on the drug molecule. So timozolomide, as Fred explained, is already accessible and can get across the blood-brain barrier. The BRD4 or the, the bromo domain inhibitor has different physical chemistry properties. And for that reason, it's not as readily sol soluble and it doesn't get across as easily. Uh, so what we did in this combination nanoparticle that has this amazing synergistic combination uh, studied by uh, Fred and, and his colleagues is get it across the blood brain barrier together. And it's really key that a cell sees both of these drugs. So having them co-packaged in this way really enables the synergism to be optimized. And in that case, we're thinking we're getting about 1.7% injected dose was one of the, uh, uh, was the amount that we measured at that time. And that for the blood brain barrier is an accomplishment. So two follow-up questions on that. One comes from Alan Rogal who asks, is there a role for focused ultrasound to try to breach the blood-brain barrier. And then in an, another question from an anonymous attendee who talks about a, a, um, a neurological drug that Voyager Therapeutics is using by direct injection. And is there a role for direct injection of nanoparticles into GBM? Wow, I'll take the ultrasound and maybe one of you two will take the other one, but uh, I'll just, there is a role for focused ultrasound. I do think 
that it depends on the means of administration and uh, and I, I do defer to the clinicians on, on this, but uh, it has been found that if you are able to compromise those blood vessels and, and the uh, tight junctions between them with ultrasound for brief periods of time, you can get drug in. And certainly that can work with uh, synergist synergistic nanoparticles as well. I'm, I'm happy to jump in here too about the, uh, the other option of directly injecting and actually both of these things are ways of getting around the blood brain barrier, meaning you can directly inject something into the tumor, but we find that things don't tend to travel in the brain more than a few millimeters. Um, and most of the tumor cells that are left behind after a surgery tend to be actually quite far away and that's what causes tumors to recur. Um, but I think actually both things could have a role specifically if you're using something like a nanotherapeutic where you're more likely to engage with the tumor cell selectively over all the healthy brain. Uh, because the, the problem with these um, non-specific ways of disrupting the blood brain barrier is you might get drug into the brain, but as Fred mentioned, the brain is very good at washing out drugs that it doesn't want there. Um, so unless they have a good reason to stick around um, to interact with a cancer cell, um, it may not buy you the exact thing you're hoping for. So I have a question. So, you know, one, one, actually, sorry, can I just finish with that? And, and one, one procedure that our medical oncology colleagues always ask us to do is insert these Omaya reservoirs uh, into the, the tumor cavities. And these are permanent uh, indwelling catheters uh, that allows oncologists such as Joelle to inject uh, chemotherapy or targeted therapies. And one can envision that we can have these OMI reservoirs in these patients, uh, whether they be pediatric or adult. And you know, now we have nanoparticles that will retain uh, at these surfaces in these cavities and in a very systemic, uh, systematic manner, deliver targeted therapies at the time that we want it to the tissue that we want it. So it's really kind of pushing the border, pushing the boundaries and the envelopes to what we can do. So there's a very detailed question here for you, Fred. It comes from Gil Covarrubias, um, who's obviously an expert in this area. He points out that glioma stem cells make up both the hypoxic cure, both, both the hypoxic core and the invasive front. And he asks whether we have looked at JQ1 and temozolomide on that population of GBM stem cells rather than just the bulk of the tumor itself. And then he comments that the two cell mouse models that we're using are from cell lines that tend to be less invasive. And he wonders, uh, this of course relates to the future work that we're planning, on whether you thought about using a more aggressive GBM model like CNS1 cells. That's a very good question. And it's almost like you read the minds of our current collaboration between the Feynman Lab and this international collaboration that we're, we're building. So, you know, uh, this work was done, uh, I, you know, maybe five, it was started about five years ago, I would say. And, you know, back then, um, you know, as a junior postdoc, I was just learning to make these models of glioma. And uh, you are totally right. These U87MG and GL261 cell lines are, are actually not representative of, of uh, they don't have a glioma stem cell population. The U87MG cell line was from a patient, uh, uh, that, from a GBM patient's tumor sample back in the 70s that was harvested and then passage multiple times. So absolutely, the next stage in this collaborative effort between the Ham Lab and the Yaffe Lab um, is then to use more, um, more, more disease-relevant patient-derived cell lines that have that glioma stem cell population that then uh, we can then interrogate the effects of bromodomain inhibitors and other types of targeted therapies. And, and I think you know, some of the work that we just published where we believe that the mechanism of action for these uh, brome domain inhibitors is actually in highly replicative uh, cells. So which would make sense for stem cells that have this natural reproductive and proliferative self-renewing capacity, perhaps, and definitely we will be studying the effects of these uh, uh, combination therapies in that uh, particular stem cell population. So I'm gonna do, let's try to do three more questions. So Young Liang has a question for Paula and that is, how does the immune system respond to the nanoparticles? Ah, great question. Uh, so typically with the kinds of either pegylated or um, very hydrated polysaccharides that we've been using, we've been trying to intentionally avoid the immune system. Uh, that said, uh, macrophages, 
take up everything, including nanoparticles. So uh, there is, uh, there are cells uh, that are part of the immune system that will engage nanoparticles. Uh, one of the things that uh, we think about is uh, where it's relevant to actually protect from these interactions. So when we're delivering and we have our initial injection um, or we're in a uh, brain capillary, we're really trying to avoid monocytes and uh, we're successful in greatly lowering the interactions with monocytes. We also don't see any signs of uh, an, an immune response or an inflammatory response of any kind with the nanoparticles that we've designed. That said, when we, um, when we know that if our nanoparticles are present in tumors that have large numbers of macrophages present, that we will be providing nanoparticles to those macrophages. Uh, and uh, this is something that we think about when we think about selectivity. Right now in our tumor models, uh, we have systems in which we know we can actually um, gain insights into the interactions with tumor cells but we also have to learn to understand their interactions with other tumor associated cells, such as uh, macrophages, stromal cells, et cetera. And sometimes we'll want to drug specifically those tumor cells, uh, understanding the systems biology of those cells uh, from our collaborators. Sometimes our collaborators may have ideas for targeting the cells that surround those tumor cells, such as immune cells. So there may be ways in which we can actually design specifically to target immune cells that are associated with tumors. There's a very practical question from jo for Joella and Fred, and that is, does the development of nanoparticles make the concept of wafers, which of course we used to implant in these drug cavities, does this sort of give this, um, is this idea worth revisiting? Fred, do you wanna go take this first? <laughs> sure. So the, the gliadel wafer that was, again, uh, you know, invented by Dr. Langer at, at MIT, you know, on the sixth floor of the Koch Institute, long history of, uh, you know, device implantation devices for GBM, you know, that, that delivered BCNU, another very nonspecific DNA damaging agent. And it was a very focused delivery of these wafers, um, and, but it was limited to how many wafers could be layered into the tumor cavity, and then this slow release of drug. Um, that would also be washed away, you know, due to CSF effects. So when you when you take away such a big tumor volume, what fills in is CSF. You know, so you 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 are releasing drug, but it's constantly being washed away. Now the beauty of the nanoparticles to be able to do that, I'm going to turn over to Joelle to answer that. I do think that there's probably some great applications. And it'll probably take even more collaborations um, on the chemical engineering side to design something that could slowly release nanoparticles that are still intact and able to do their function. Um, but really we know in this disease, just as we're all collaborating here, we're gonna continue to need to do that. We're gonna continue to need surgery, likely radiation. But the question is, can we then add in that kind of key factor that allows drugs that are relevant to stay at the tumor for a long enough period of time? So. It's a great question and something we need to keep visiting. Given that we're close on time, I'm gonna answer one question myself and then I'll turn one final question over to the panel. So Sama Ali asks, what about using two different strategies of treatment to cover two or three targeted mechanisms um, with biologicals in addition to drugs? And of course, as I suspect you know, this has been the focus of much of the research that my lab and, and our work with Fred has focused on. The idea that you should not necessarily view these as exclusive options, either biologicals or cytotoxic drugs, but the correct marriage of the two could have real benefit. In fact, as Professor Hammond showed, it was exactly that idea of using a small molecule inhibitor in cytotoxic chemotherapy that was the motivation um, for that fantastic collaboration we had with her lab looking at triple negative breast cancer. And in work that we've been doing Fred really has championed together um, with Yi Kong in our lab, it's clear that if you target specific signaling pathways that respond to DNA damage, the ATR check one pathway, the P38MK2 pathway, you can get extra benefit from using cytotoxic drugs like temozolomide and JQ1. And the question really for the future is, what's the correct combination of targeted agents and cytotoxic chemotherapies together? Now, the last question that there have been several uh, innumerable requests for is, um, 
how close is this to being able to go into the clinic? Um, clearly, there are barriers to being able to apply this to the clinic, but one of the um, viewers points out that, in fact, she recently lost her brother, an oncologist, to GBM, and there is a desperate need. Um, what do people think? How far away are we from being able to pursue a clinical trial? Well, you know, there's there's now a, a real effort towards pushing towards phase zero uh, clinical trials of, of any novel therapies to, to exactly address that need is that current therapy, current standard of care is just not working. You know, so there there's definitely at the national level an impetus at the NIH level and at the FDA level to then to push forward these novel uh, biology-based, evidence-based preclinical therapies. And, you know, I think Mike and I, you know, we can speak from the, the biology side um, and, you know, Paul and Joel can definitely talk about, you know, when are nanoparticles going to start, uh, you know, showing up in the clinic? Absolutely. And uh, nanoparticles are just beginning to make their way through clinic. Uh, there have been uh, recently siRNA containing nanoparticles and uh, companies like Moderna putting out mRNA nanoparticles. I think that uh, the, um, there are a number, and in fact, uh, I'll, I'll turn things over to Joel, who actually did a recent uh, review of the ones that are in clinical trials now. Uh, we believe that by sticking to simple, uh, generally regarded as safe material sets, uh, and essentially uh, using naturally occurring polysaccharides and ligands and proteins that are understood that we have a better chance of getting across um, some of the early hurdles with FDA approval so that we can get into clinical trial. Um, manufacturability is also one of the things that is key uh, to a clinical trial. And we've been looking at ways to essentially uh, uh, scale the processes that we have in lab so that we can readily generate uh, significant amounts of nanoparticle. I'm going to turn things over to Joelle because she has been looking at the nanomedicine landscape recently. Oh, thanks, Paula. Yes, and it's, so I think um, there's at least two trials, even in pediatric neuro-oncology right now, that are taking advantage of nanoparticles as a way to take drugs that normally have no crossing of the blood-brain barrier and very poor solubility, even in the bloodstream, and putting them into the tumor. These are primarily using nanoparticles in a way to just encapsulate, but not target. And so I think we are seeing things enter the clinic um, much more quickly these days from the, the laboratory where they were invented straight into the clinic. Um, but we do also want to take advantage of this targeting ability um, and the ability to try to get the, the drug to the right cells um, and not let it just be everywhere in the brain. So I think that we're in some ways moving quite quickly, but in other ways we wanna be a little, take a little step back and have a really good understanding of, of what's going on with the biology um, and also the side effect profile. And so with that, I wanna thank all of our presenters, Professor Hammond, Dr. Strayella, Dr. Lamb, and you, the audience, for asking such fantastic questions um, and taking time out of your busy schedules to attend tonight's event. It is, as always, a great pleasure for us to be able to share with you ongoing work at the Koch Institute. And with that, I will bid you a good evening and hope to see you soon at future with Insight events. Thank you very much.